From advertising to software as a service to data. Across all of our programs and clients, we've seen a 55 to 65 percent open rate. Getting brands authentically integrated into content performs better than TV advertising. Typical lifespan of an article is about 24 to 36 hours. If we're reaching out to the right person with the right message and a clear call to action, then it's just a matter of timing. Welcome to the MarTech Podcast, a member of the I Hear Everything Podcast Network. In this podcast, you'll hear the stories of world-class marketers that use technology to drive business results and achieve career success. Here's the host of the MarTech Podcast, Benjamin Shapiro. Welcome to the MarTech Podcast. I'm Benjamin Shapiro, the executive producer of the MarTech Podcast, and today we've got a special episode for you, which is going to be guest hosted by Doug Bell, who's the CMO of Chief Outsiders. Doug is a veteran CMO with a background in helping growth stage B2B SaaS companies reach their true potential, and I'm thrilled to invite him and some of his friends to take the microphone and share their knowledge with you, our loyal MarTech Podcast listeners. Okay, here's a special episode of the MarTech Podcast, guest hosted by Doug Bell, the CMO of Chief Outsiders. Hello, marketers. My name is Doug Bell from Chief Outsiders. And today, we're going to discuss navigating knowledge layers and overcoming friction in commerce. Joining me today is Chris Mall, who is the president and COO at Prion, which was founded in 2017 by the minds behind Amazon's Alexa, Apple Siri, and IBM's Watson. Prion's full-stack, no-code, AI-enhanced knowledge management platform transforms untapped digital assets from multiple sources into solutions that measurably improve outcomes. And today, Chris and I are going to be talking about deployment of knowledge layers. Okay, here's my conversation with Chris Small, the president and COO at Prion. Chris, welcome back to the podcast, and thanks for being a repeat guest. Great to be here, and we couldn't be more excited about sharing really this groundbreaking asset that everybody already has, but it's just broken up called knowledge. Well, it was an enlightening conversation for me, and I have to say, uh, I talked to a lot of brilliant people with a lot of great ideas about sort of how to refactor the market, and this one stood out. So for people that are hearing from Chris for the first time or learning about Prion or learning about knowledge layers for the first time, I'm going to have Chris kick us off and talk about exactly really what a knowledge fabric or knowledge layer is and how it's organized. So Chris, I'm going to give you the floor. Talk to us about what this thing is and how do organizations deploy one? In many sense, and this is true for a small, medium or large, or even a government agency, the knowledge, the needed knowledge exists. But of course, it's fractured and it's in different locations and it is in different representations. And one way to think about, you know, what a knowledge layer is, it's the millisecond truth that I could ask questions like you and I are talking and I could get the answer out of all the knowledge that exists inside the company. So the layer is actually that new representation of all that truth. So A, firms we work with and they're Fortune 50 firms, the knowledge is all there, but it's broken. It's broken in many parts and pieces. So the layer we're talking about is something that's new. And this is what we call the fabric layer of knowledge. And that fabric is woven together, and it's really the right word to describe, from existing particles inside a company. I'll give you an example. So I'm a uh, game manufacturer, and I have lots of technical parts and pieces, and I have tens of thousands of gamers that come to my website and, and want to learn things about very specific parts. And they're in knowledge articles, they're in product articles, they might be in support articles. And the answers are there, but they're across these different systems inside a firm. And a knowledge layer, an effective knowledge layer for that audience of gamers would be one where all that information is lifted together and woven together. We call it fusing into a fabric where I, as a visitor, can ask a question, whether it's of a bot or a digital human or whatever interface makes sense. And I can ask it like I'm talking to you right now. And the system can, in milliseconds, go across potentially thousands, if not millions of articles and with high, high, high accuracy deliver that answer back to me. And that answer can be delivered in a couple of forms. One is certainly a chatbot presentation. Second is a digital human speaking the answer. Third is a video served up in response. And that video starts in line at the right moment in time where I, as perhaps the CEO of the company that I'm investigating, is speaking the answer. And that's what the manifested knowledge layer looks like. An ability for people to do something that we've all been talking about, which is semantic computing. And for marketers, 
when we think about the carnival, I think about the carnival as like the original marketing that used to travel around state to state and all these people would come there in the late 18 whatevers. And there was the Barker and the Barker was the attractive. Come on in, enjoy my game. And then there was the people that would figure out, is there somebody that really is of interest here? I think they call it the blow off, which is kind of a hard term, but that is the origin story. And then there's something which we wouldn't use today, but the show was somebody who would try to get your money to play the game. So that's turn of the century stuff and how the world used to sort of, in a traveling show sense, try to get people interested in what they had to offer as a service entertainment. Now it's obviously in our websites and it's inside our company and it's on the content we've shot, the road shows we've done, and people are still interested in those answers. And they're interested because of humans uh, being humans and speaking. The knowledge layer is the new representation of all that content in a digital fabric. We call it a knowledge fabric that is in milliseconds available. So that's what Prion set out to deliver and has, in fact, delivered. We've done this inside the government. We've done this with Fortune 10 firms. We've done this with credit unions now. We've done this with all sorts of firms. And for the first time, the asset they built, the content that is all over the firm, is organized through a platform into its own representation of itself a fabric which self-organizes around the question you ask as a consumer, an employee, or a partner, and you get in milliseconds that answer in a very rich digital experience. It doesn't have to just be a chatbot. It could be a video. It could be a digital human. The city of Amarillo is a good example of one of our clients where there's people who have 73 different dialects. I think it's actually 82. And they're coming to a city agency and they're speaking to it about titles and searches and taxes and the city services. And that digital human is answering their question in the tongue in which they ask the question out of trusted information that, by the way, the city's had for years. They just haven't had the fabric in front of it so that that asset could go to work. I hope that's helpful. And there's a whole lot more we can dig into, but that is what the knowledge fabric is. So it feels like we've got a combination of things. And what I really want to dig into here is how are organizations able to deploy something like a knowledge layer or a knowledge fabric? But I want to unpack a little bit of this first. So let's talk about the knowledge layer, Chris, as the exposing siloed data in a way that maybe would be familiar to anybody that's tried to consolidate databases. I'm going to oversimplify things for now. And then on top of that, we're talking about how does that data relate within itself? What are the structures? That is the knowledge fabric, if you will. In other words, creating the ability to rationalize that first data set and then provide the relation between all those different data sets in a way. And then this is what you're getting sort of the, some of the use cases. I love the city of Amarillo as an example, because I think that calls out the level of complexity that can now be handled by a knowledge fabric. So do I have that right in terms of sort of how to think about deployment and those two, if you will, different aspects, knowledge layer versus knowledge fabric? So the first part of deployment of a fabric is what's the use case? And what we find fascinating is all of our clients, when they launch the first one, have a kind of, oh, wow moment. And they realize that I can take all these assets and I can put them together in this fabric and I can apply them to you, consumer, prospect, partner, employee, and you can unlock the value of information in ways that make you really productive or in the words of marketers, super engaged. I'll actually talk about a hospital chain, which is really interesting because you think about the websites of a hospital chain, and this is one of the larger ones, major metropolitan one. They have 27 websites that are around domiciled important information that the major DMA, this is the tri-state area, seeks medical answers and medical expertise from. And those 27 websites are, in some cases, and they're representative of the quality of the physicians, the science, the research, the services, all sorts of things. And when you think about that, that is kind of a knowledge layer, but not really. It's a representation layer is what I'll call it. And in some of the work we're doing with them, they realize almost immediately that, hey, now that we've seen your knowledge layer connect to and bring together and unify that information in an automated infrastructure and do it with rationalizing technologies. And the first thing about the knowledge layer that our systems do, and there's a bunch of parts and pieces, vectorization, OCR, recognition, we can talk for hours and hours about what's built in there. But believe it or not, the first part of building a true knowledge fabric is to understand the content. Now, when you think about the knowledge stores that are used, content management systems, content delivery systems, they don't understand anything about the content. They know that it's this file and it's this place and it was this author. And some other group of people, administrators and technologists, have to wire that file to that location on the site. And that's the nimbleness with which you're responding to the audience's interest. What's different in the knowledge layer than just from CMSs as we know them and love them is that when we build the fabric, the system understands all content. Let me give you an example. This is a product spec. 
And in that product spec is a schematic and there's features and there's avenues of value and there's deep specs and there's differentiated specs than other things in the market. When our knowledge fabric system starts to ingest it, it literally reads it all, including graphs and tables. So now the fabric has a level of intelligence about what's going in it that doesn't match really anything. That's step one. And you can do that with PowerPoints, PDFs. You can do that with literally unlimited microfish. And one of our clients, is, as you probably know, is Westinghouse. And some of the information inside of their knowledge fabric has to do with nuclear engineered parts. Sorry to interrupt you, Chris. For the Gen Zers out there, microfish was the primary way of storing data for a really, really long time. It yeah. is literally tapes <laughs> of photos. It's just too funny. As I look at you, I realize you and I have been in front of all those microfish, microfilm screens. It's the size of our living rooms. Well, what the knowledge fabric can do is ingest it and understand it. I can take that three by three card that might have 100 articles of the New York Times in it, and I can understand it. And now I've got it built into the fabric. So one is all these different things are ingested in the fabric, but then the fabric self-organizes around concepts and facts. So as I now understand it, it turns out this video, this PowerPoint, this design spec, this research paper are all dealing with the same subjects. They may have been written at different times by different authors of different value and different complexity, but in fact, it's the same subject. It begins to self-organize that information around itself. And then once the fabric, and so, you know, that can go on and on. We have, you know, tens of millions of documents in some of these. So that's sort of phase one and two. What information, now understand the information, now begin to self-organize that information. And before a fabric is launched, there's a series of question test suites that it self-generates and tests itself. So imagine if you and I are doing it around, let's pick Diageo, and it's all their different alcohol beverages. And there's different subtleties around fragrance and flavors and aging and all the things they do. And now I've organized all this information around all my brands. And I can ask one question about aging, a certain type of aging, and it will understand that across all these different brands. And I'm looking for a specific answer with a specific range. And it'll organize all the answers and begin to show me these answers. Doesn't matter when that information was. So ingest it, understand it, self-organize it, and then you get to interact with it. And that interaction can be concentrated in all kinds of experiences. The other thing about this knowledge fabric, just to bring the vitality of its power to the forefront, is once I have that knowledge fabric there, and I now have constituents, employees, partners, customers, it doesn't matter, interacting with it, the fabric is intelligent about what it does and doesn't know. So it doesn't ever generate. So this is, this is for marketers. Generative is awesome, and we use a certain type of generative that's safe and secure, but it is not for an exact answer. It's for an approximated answer. In our world, we build these knowledge fabrics out of the content that our clients have built, so the answer comes just from their content. There's nothing made up about it. And as a result of that, now we use forms of generative to smooth it and summarize and make it look beautiful, but it's still your words, and it's still directly attributable to your product engineers that wrote the spec for this chipset that your researchers want to get to. So the power of the fabric is kind of unlimited in that regard in terms of its first version, and then it begins to self-explain missing parts. So imagine if we got 100,000 customers that come to a different site. Let's say it's at and site, and they're asking really specific questions about a product that it doesn't have the answer to. Well, the fabric begins to signal to the authors, subject matter experts, that your audience has a real interest in this area. You should authenticate and or address it with content that speaks to it. So the vitality of a fabric is very different than a CMS, right? CMS, and we're going to blend ourselves into marketing a little bit, People are dropping off the page, they're going away, and maybe they're going to fill out surveys and say what they didn't get. Well, in a knowledge fabric, I actually know what they were looking for. And I actually know what we didn't have an answer to. So that gets weighted and scored and delivered to the subject matter experts. And you can respond in near real time, actually in real time, with repurposing of intelligence. Now you're getting into our waters of this new science. We call it the prion quotient of that fabric. And what does that mean? How much of the interactive experience are you providing valuable responses to? And as an ability to engineer the fabric, when I know, and let's just use engineers, let's assume you have 5,000 engineers in the company that deal with very technical information, and that information has to address either the building of a technical product, delivery of it, installation of it, maintenance of it, upgrading of it, lots of different experiences along that. And I can tell you that the answers that that fabric gives those engineers is 90% what they need. The productivity on the other side of that is unbelievable. With the 10% I don't do, because it is a fabric and not Qualtrics reports that I'm sending to them to ask questions of if, if you know, did I satisfy you? I'm immediately able, even in that hour, 
to begin to think about content that's missing or knowledge that's missing and purposes can get it, get it in there. And now that 97% goes to 99. That's what we call the prime quotient. So I know I got a little conceptual there, but that's because we're dealing in knowledge fabrics, which is not the same thing as just content management. We're going to hark back in time. We went back to college here, Chris, you and I, we talked about uh, microfiche and sitting in front of these giant consoles. Yeah, let's go back, maybe not quite that far. But... I mean, if there was a poll on your live broadcast, people would be like, I don't know what they're talking about. But anyway, <laughs> you don't need to worry about this, folks. This is before the digital age. But there was a real movement that still exists out there. And frankly, a lot of revenue being generated around organizations that during the pandemic recognized that they were needing to transform their information into digital, so digital transformation. And the analog here for me is we had these incredible telecom systems in the Western world that became antiquated almost overnight when cellular telecom took over. And so you would find yourself in a situation where you were in India or you were in China, which at that time were less developed countries. You would be there and you'd be realizing they have much stronger cell phone networks, but you couldn't get anybody on the landline. So on some level, I feel like, and this is not a use case I want to cover, but this is what really kind of blows my mind is. This potentially is something that just goes right around this from an infrastructure standpoint, the idea of knowledge layers and fabric. In other words, digital transformation on some level, this exercise we're going through, one of those use cases is, you know, effectively kind of leapfrogging that. But I had to mention just because it's something that really stands out for me. But what I really want to do is to start understanding potential impacts for marketing organizations. And let me put a use case in front of you. So the standard challenge that we see is this. We have a huge amount of information that marketers attempt to render to prospects in a way that's going to get some reaction. Let's say that positive reaction is, I sign up for a trial, I buy your product, I explore a white paper, whatever those things are. And when we do that, we're sort of counting on our ability to use and read data to put up and then iterate and test again and again and again, which content, which combination with my website under which structure is going to provide the highest performance. And by the way, by the time you figure that out, the prospect changed, the buyer journey changes, the market changes. Everything's changed. Yeah, so I can nail this one pretty hard, and I can do it from two perspectives. I don't know if you ever knew of, so for, for marketers that did early-scale digital buying across all the media landscape, one of the problems for the biggest marketers, the biggest brand marketers, was I'm trying to buy you. You are a head of household making this kind of income with these kind of interests, and I'll, I'll pay top dollar, but I can't get many of you. This is actually a period of my career. And oh my God, it's running out. And now I want to buy you across all websites. I don't care where you are. And that's actually the birth of the ad exchanges. And the whole idea was it was behavioral targeting and it was behavioral targeting on Yahoo North. I mean, I know way more about advertising and tech than the average machine learning executive. It could be any number of sites. And I also want to pay those advertisers the best dollars. So they'll give me those impressions. That is what the ad exchanges were about. I happen to be one of the executives of Right Media, which is at the dawn of targeted buying cross sites, cross brand sites. And what was I doing? I was buying you based on demographic data and signals that I got from you. What I could never buy you from is the words that came out of your mouth. I could know where you were. I was trace buying. This is where he visits and this is where he is now. And it was targeting and it was personalization and targeting. Two of our favorite terms in marketing at the end of the day. You're the right person and I can speak to you the right way. And I had to do that through forensic digital forensics and data services and enhanced data services. This is the digital landscape. And I was there. I mean, Right Media was really early on. There was Avenue A and you know these firms, right? These were big firms that were trying to figure out how do I take people running across the website world and trace enough information so I can tell you as a big buyer that you're going to get the right folks. And that will always be a function of, I will call it forensic technologies. I'm guessing who you are and I have a high confidence. In the world we live in today, people will tell you what they want, but there are no technologies that respond to the words they use. That is the difference between the knowledge fabric and all the transformative digital technologies. What we're doing is allowing your content to be self-organizing around the words of the buyer, the prospect, the candidate. And that's really the simplest way I can describe the two because beyond personalization, so if I think about you and me visiting any store, and I walk in the store, digital or otherwise, I'm there for a reason, and I can tell you in words why I'm there. But I have to, through digital experiences, frustrate my way through pages of things that you were talking about. How do you get that combo together? What the knowledge fabric does is allow the buyer to express themselves and get the results they're looking for in milliseconds that are right from their own sentiment. That is what turns this on its head 
from a marketer's perspective versus all the mechanics we use, and I know a lot of them, to try to figure out how to get to you. So imagine if I go down to the Super Bowl and there's a lot of different vendors around the Super Bowl that are showing their wares and you get to experience it. But imagine if you can go into an immersive digital conversation with that brand and have that brand surface back to you the things you're looking for you or guide you to that. That is the nature of a knowledge fabric because it is designed as a semantic AI derived collection of your information, which is how people work. I'm throwing some terms in there that are part of our architecture and technology. So if I'm a marketer, there's nothing I'd rather do than give you exactly what you're looking for. And there's nothing I'd rather do than do it in a way where you're asking for what you're looking for and I'm delivering that. That is the nature of a knowledge fabric versus the layers of digital transformation that are out there. Let's just talk about maybe the elephant in the room. We're talking about a particular brand with a particular person. But really what I think that we're talking about here is the sea change in the way that we collect, organize, and render data that I think, in my humble opinion, with lots of gray hairs, has the potential to really answer some hidden questions for marketers and sellers around how do we deploy these new technologies to ultimately reduce friction. So I want to leave the listeners with this today. Folks, self-organizing content. And let's talk about how we're going to use that in the future, whether it's Prion, and I really hope it is because these are smart people who do amazing things, or somebody else. This is really where the market is taking us. It's answering that question, self-organizing content. So Chris, I'd love to have you come back. Let's dig into this a bit further. Let's talk about those use cases. I love the fact that you were out there doing ad buys. I love that you're doing it forensically because we're going to start tomorrow's conversation. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you very much. Okay, that wraps up this MarTech Insider episode of the MarTech Podcast. Thanks to Chris Small, President and COO at Prion for joining us today. In part two of this interview, which we're going to publish tomorrow, Chris and I are going to dig in and talk about how knowledge friction impacts commerce. If you can't wait until our next episode and would like to learn more about Chris, you can find a link to his LinkedIn profile in our show notes. You can also contact him on Twitter, where his handle is at Chris Mall and why, or visit his company website at prion.com. Okay, that wraps up this episode of the MarTech Podcast. Thanks to our guest host, Doug Bell, the CMO of Chief Outsiders. If you'd like to get in touch with Doug, you could find a link to his LinkedIn profile in our show notes, or you can contact him on Twitter, where his handle is Market Advocate. Or you could just visit his website, which is chiefoutsiders.com. Just one more link in our show notes I'd like to tell you about. If you didn't have a chance to take notes while you were listening to this podcast, head over to martechpod.com where we have summaries of all of our episodes and contact information for our guests. You can also subscribe to our weekly newsletter and you can even apply to be the next guest speaker on the MarTech Podcast. Of course, you can always reach out on social media. Our handle is martechpod, M-A-R-T-E-C-H-P-O-D on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Or you can contact me directly on LinkedIn. My handle is Ben J. Schapp. B-E-N-J-S-H-A-P. And if you haven't subscribed yet and you want a daily stream of marketing and technology knowledge in your podcast feed, we're going to publish an episode every day this year. So hit the subscribe button in your podcast app and we'll be back in your feed tomorrow morning. All right, that's it for today. But until next time, my advice is to just focus on keeping your customers happy. 